Thank you, Lillian, for the introduction. And welcome from sunny Bonn. Yeah, so what I'm going to do in these four lectures is um, an elementary approach to point counting and exponential sums. We'll see that this is, um, in some sense, very similar point counting on for curves over finite fields and exponential sums. And there are several approaches to this. Um, I will take a, a rather elementary approach, which doesn't require much more than basic algebra. Nevertheless, it's, it's quite clever and quite powerful. And I want to introduce you to that. And um, all of this is based on this book, as you can see by Wolfgang Schmidt, Equations Over Finite Fields. Um, there is also a, cha a chapter in Ivan Kowalski where this is uh, contained in a somehow very short, uh, um, yeah, in a very short chapter. Yeah, anyway, so let me start with uh, paragraph zero. Uh huh. Okay, what's going on here? All right. Okay, so now the pen is willing to write. Okay, so paragraph zero is a motivating example. Okay, yeah, so we have seen the polynomial method in action for various problems. And here's a problem from arithmetic. So suppose you're given a fixed natural number T and a prime P. And I define L to be the number of all X in FP such that simultaneously X plus one, X plus two, and so on up to X plus T, each of them is a square. And I want to know how often does this happen that you have T consecutive squares in a row modulo P. Okay, what would you expect? Um, probabilistically, the chance that something is a square is one half, and the chance that t consecutive things are a square should be one over two to the t. So we would expect that this is roughly p over two to the t. Well, this cannot be a precise equation. There must be an error term. And we would think that there is square root cancellation with an implied constant depending on t. So how would you prove this? The strategy would be, okay, how can you detect the square by the Legendre symbol? So chi p is the Legendre symbol. And then we can just count. So one plus the Legendre symbol counts the number of solutions. So one plus chi p of x plus one gives the number of solutions um, of x plus one being a square. So we multiply this, all of this together, one plus chi p x plus t, sum this up over x in fp. And this is essentially two to the t times l. Maybe there is an O of one error because there, I don't know, something may be divisible by p or endpoints or something like this. So let's give ourselves maybe an O of one error here. Okay, I multiply this out, all of this, and the ones give the expected main term, namely p. And everything that every term that contains some character should go into the error term. So if I multiply this out, multiplying out, it suffices to show that sum chi p of f of x is O of p to the one half, where f is a polynomial that's, well, depend, it, it, it consists of some of some linear factors. So it's something like x plus a1 up to x plus ak for pairwise distinct a1 up to ak. Okay, but k is greater than, it's, it's, at, it's at least one and it can be at most t. 
All right, so that's what we want to show. And this would follow, and this shows that point counting and character sums are something very similar. This follows if the equation y square equals f of x, because after all, the Legendre symbol detects whether something is a square or not. So if this equation as an equation in two variables, x and y, has p plus o of p to the one half solutions. Right, because if there is a solution, if I find an x, then I find two values of y. So if there are p solutions, then I have p times, a, p, p over two times a square, p over two times a non-square, they cancel, and I have the error term p to the one half that I want to get. So that's what I need to show. So solutions in x, y, in f, p squared. Okay, so the plan for at least this lecture and the next lecture, well, maybe even the next three lectures, we want to show that the number n, which is the cardinality of the pairs x, y in fq times fq, where now q is a prime power, so fq is some finite field, of y to the d minus f of x equals zero. This cardinality is q, oops, is q plus square root q in the error term. And the error term, we'll see what it depends on. Um, let's see, we'll start with a weak version and then improve the error term and make it more uniform later. For some polynomial f in fqx, under certain assumptions, to be on the safe side, I'll talk about this in the moment just to make sure that what I write down is correct because under certain assumptions, everything's correct. Yeah, uh, and let's see what assumptions do we need? I mean, so we would hope, of course, so gen generically, if I take some polynomial f, then the probability that it's a dth power should be one over d. And um, if it is a dth power, uh, then I get these d solutions. So with probability one over d, I get d solutions. So I expect q solutions. Yeah? So that's roughly the heuristic. And then there is an error term of square roots cancellation size. Okay, let's look at some counter examples where this is definitely wrong to see what assumptions we actually need. So here is a cheap counter example. Suppose d is two and f happens to be a square square polynomial like x squared then we have y squared minus x squared and of course this is I mean then x squared is always a square so then n is roughly 2q and not q okay so that's that's definitely um, wrong in this case but that's somehow a cheap example a slightly more interesting example More interesting example. So suppose you have a prime P is congruent three mod eight. You'll see in a moment why this is relevant. And consider the polynomial Y square equals, so D is again two, two times X to the four plus four X squared plus two, which as you can easily see is twice a square. Yeah, so since P is congruent three mod eight, two is not a square. And so this has no solutions unless Y is zero. But if Y is zero, then X plus one must be zero. So X plus one squared in fact, but minus one is not a square either. So there are absolutely no solutions at all. So since, Ah, sorry, x squared. So, 
since neither two nor minus one are squares in FP, we have n equals zero, not n equals p, yeah? So this is a, an example, and why is this relevant? Well, the first example, if f is simply a square, is stupid, because then y squared minus f is reducible. But in this case, y squared minus two times x squared plus one squared is irreducible. So note that y squared minus two times x squared plus one squared, so let's call this f of x, is irreducible over fp, x, y. Yeah, so it doesn't even suffice to require that y to the d minus f is irreducible. We need more. We need it's absolutely irreducible. So it has to be irreducible over each extension field, so over the um, algebraic closure. So it's not irreducible, and that's the key point, and that's why this fails. So it's not irreducible over fp adjoint square root of two, xy, yeah, which is fp squared. Yeah, and this is why it fails. It's, it's, it's reducible over some extension field, some algebraic extension field. Okay, so the critical um, assumption that we need uh, for this to be true is that y to the d minus f of x is absolutely irreducible, okay? And that's the plan for the next few, few lectures to show this. Uh, and we will do this using the polynomial method. Okay, so that was the motivating example and somehow the, the preparation and, or the somehow the motivation and now comes the preparation. Okay, let me start with a definition. What is absolutely irreducible? A polynomial f in k x y, k is a field, is absolutely irreducible if it cannot be factored over k bar. Okay, and that's what we need. And how can I see whether or not a polynomial is absolutely irreducible? It's in fact easy to see, essentially, well, more or less. Um, so suppose you have a non-zero polynomial in one variable, then the following are equivalent a y to the d minus f of x is absolutely irreducible. b, I can change this by a constant, c times f of x is absolutely irreducible for every non-zero c in k. And part C, and that's the interesting criterion. If I factorize F over the algebraic closure, so I write F as a product of linear monic polynomials with some multiplicity, J from whatever, one to R, with pairwise distinct AJ, and then there is maybe some constant in between, and so in, in, in front, if this is the factorization over k bar with all the aj's pairwise distinct,
Then the GCD of the exponents, d1, d2, up to dr, and d is 1. So d is this d here, and we have these dj's. And if all the dj's and the d are as a tuple, as an r plus 1 tuple coprime, then the polynomial in two variables, y to the d minus f of x, is absolutely irreducible. Okay, you can easily see that a implies b because every number c has a dth root over the algebraic closure. So if the polynomial in b is reducible, then the polynomial in a is also reducible. So from a to b is clear. From B to C is also clear um, because obviously if the DJs and D share a common divisor, then you can factor this out using a binomial formula. So the only hard part is to show that C implies A, right? So this criterion is not only necessary, but it's also sufficient. Okay, it's not so hard. It's, um, I don't know, half a page and you can find the proof in Schmidt's book. Chapter 1.2. All right. So this is what we need to know about absolutely irreducible. The next thing that we need is a very useful variation of the derivative. So the polynomial method, as you have seen in the previous week, is all about finding a polynomial with controlled degree and many zeros. And how do you detect zeros of a polynomial? Well, you use the derivative. But we are working over finite fields and the derivative has a deficiency when it comes to finite fields. If you have something like x cubed over f3 and you take the derivative, then all of a sudden the polynomial becomes the zero polynomial. Um, so we need to do something about this. And this is an idea that goes back to Hasse and that's why it's called the Hasse derivative. It's a small variation that just somehow repairs this defect. So it goes as follows. Take an integer, positive integer or zero, that's k. And on the vector space, kx, the polynomial ring, polynomial ring kx, we define an operator, a linear map, a linear operator that I call E superscript K, and it's the kth Hasse derivative. It's the kth Hasse derivative. as follows. Well, it's a, if it's a linear map, it suffices to say what it does on monomials. And I map x to the n to, oops, to the binomial coefficient n over k, x to the minus, to the n minus k. With the usual convention that if k is greater than n, then the binomial coefficient vanishes. So n over k is zero for k greater than n. Okay, so if the characteristic of my underlying field is zero, then the kth has a derivative is the same as the kth derivative up to a factorial. Yeah. So if characteristic k is zero, then e k is one over k factorial, kth power of the usual derivative. But notice that e2 is not e1 composed with e1. Yeah, e2 is something different. That's the whole point. Okay, 
Okay, so some properties of this Hasse derivative. First, we have something like the Leibniz rule. We have EK of, in fact, it's even easier than the Leibniz rule because there are no coefficients. It's uh, the kindergarten Leibniz rule, I plus J equals K, EI of F, EJ of G. Okay. Then secondly, it commutes with shifts. EK sends X minus C to N over K, X minus C, sorry, X minus C to the power N to N over K, X minus C to the power N minus K. So it commutes with additive shifts. And also a simple rule, if K is less than N, FG are polynomials, then If I take the case has a derivative of something that contains an nth power of some polynomial, then this retains at least an n minus k power of g. Yeah? Times something else, let's call it h with degree of h is less than what you expect, degree of f plus k times degree of g minus one. Okay, all of this is very easy, just use the definition. All right, and the key lemma is that the Hasser derivative, even over finite fields, really detects zeros. So suppose that the case Hasse derivative of some polynomial evaluated at A is zero for k equals zero, one, and so on, until say m minus one. So we have m, an m fold zero in some sense, and that's really what we have. Then f has a zero of order at least m at a. And notice that this is incorrect for the usual derivative. If you take x cubed over the field with three elements, then you can take a million derivatives, they all vanish at zero, but it's still only a zero of order three. Yeah? Even though a million derivatives vanish at zero. Yeah? But the, Hasse derivative, the, the third Hasse derivative of x cubed is just one and it's not zero, right? And that's the key point. Okay, proof. Without loss of generality, because it's invariant under shifts, we can assume A is zero. And then if F is some AJ X to the J, then the kth derivative of F is some bj, oh, also aj, anyway, so let's, let's do this, bj, is bj j over k x to the j minus k. And if I plug in zero for x with all the values of k, then we see that all the bj's must, so the first bj's must all be zero. So B0 equals B1 equals up to Bm minus one equals zero. And this means precisely that F has a zero of order at least M. Okay, and one final technical lemma that we will need at some point for the Hasse derivative. Suppose that K has characteristic P greater than zero. T 
take an integer m and suppose that an integer little k is bounded by p to the m. Take a polynomial in two variables, h, and consider the following specialization as a one variable polynomial. R of x is h of x comma x to the p to the m. Yeah, so I have a polynomial in two variables and I specialize the second variable to be a certain power of x and then I get a one variable polynomial. So what happens when I apply the Hasse derivative to R? So what is EK of R of X? So I would have to apply some sort of chain rule or something, because if I plug in the definition, then I have a polynomial in two variables and I need to take the derivative in both variables. But the nice thing is that I actually only have to take the derivative in one variable. So I only take the Hasse derivative with respect to the first variable. And I simply plug in x and x to power p to the m, where e1 is the kth Hasse derivative with respect to the first variable, yeah? So I can pretend that the second variable is a constant, it's independent of X, and I can just take derivatives with respect to the first variable. That's what this says. Yeah, in this special case, of course, where the second variable is X to the P to the M, the characteristic of K is P and K, which is the number of times I take the Hasse derivative is bounded by P to the M. Okay, this is maybe not obvious. And this requires a proof. All right, let's prove this. Now, we first, we can first make the simplifying assumption that H uh, is just a monomial because then it extends by linearity. So without loss of generality, assume that H is a monomial x to the a, y to the b. Okay, and what do we need to show? We must prove that the case has a derivative of x to the a plus b times p to the m is the case has a derivative of x to the a multiplied by x to the b times p to the m. That's precisely the statement of the lemma. All right, now, what is this? Well, by the Leibniz rule, this is some i plus j equals k, the i-th derivative of x to the a times the j's derivative of x to the b times p to the m. And what do I want to show? I want to show that only the term i equals k survives. So I want to show that the j positive terms vanish and only the case i equals k, j equals zero survives. So why is this? Well, what is the binomial coefficient? The binomial coefficient is b times p to the m over j. And if you write this as factorials, you can factor out the first term, b times p to the m over j, times the binomial coefficient b times p to the m minus one over j minus one. And notice, that j is positive, so j minus one is non-negative. And also j is less or equal than k, and k is bounded by p to the m, it's strictly less than p to the m. So j is strictly less than p to the m. And so there is a p power in the numerator. 
And so in characteristic P, this is zero. Okay, that's it. All right, this was some technical preparation, um, just to make you familiar with the Hasse derivative, and this is something we need later. And one last lemma, and then we start actually with the business. This is only some, somehow some uh, recollection about norms and traces of extension fields. So let new be a positive integer and let the trace new and the norm new be the relative trace and the relative norm be the relative trace and relative norm from the extension field FQ to the new down to FQ. So in other words, the trace new of some X is the sum of the conjugates X plus X to the power Q plus X to the power Q squared and so on, plus X to the power Q to the power new minus one. And the norm new of X is the product of the conjugates. So it's X to the power Q to the new minus one over Q minus one. All right. So then we have the following. Suppose that D divides Q minus one. Q minus one is the order of the multiplicative group of the field FQ. And I can detect whether something is a D power in the extension field by looking at its norm. So an element W in FQ to the new is a D power if and only if the norm down to FQ is a deep power. Yeah, so you can detect deep powers in extension fields by just taking the norm and looking, let's just see whether it's a, a deep power downstairs. Okay, secondly, there is a question in the chat, yeah. Um, let's call this, yeah, one of them is X, one of them is W, thanks. Um, let's call this X. Yeah, all right, thanks. And the elements A, in FQ to the new with trace zero, trace new of A equals zero are precisely the elements of the form. A is B to the Q minus B. You see that their trace is zero because this is a telescoping sum. So anything of the form B to the Q minus B, this being a telescoping sum has trace zero. For B in FQ to the new. And if I'm given an A of this form, then the B the, the possible B is not necessarily unique. Well, it is not unique, obviously, because by Frobenius, I can shift this by an element in FQ, but that's the only option that I have. So the possible choices for a fixed A, the possible choices of B are precisely those 
of the form b plus c, where c is in fq. Yeah, so if I have one b, then I can shift it by an element in fq, and then by Frobenius, I get the same a, um, but that's all the options that I have. Okay, that's also easy to see, a little, so a little bit of algebra, uh, but not very hard. All right, um, so I just stated this so that we have available, have it available later, because we'll need this, these facts later, not necessarily today, um, but maybe tomorrow or on Wednesday. All right, so after this maybe somewhat dry preparation, um, we start with, sorry, we start with uh, the topic that this summer school is all about, namely the polynomial method. The ideas are not new at all. You have seen these ideas several times uh, in the past week, um, but maybe it's new in this context. Okay, so recall what is the, what is the goal? The goal is to show this red thing here. Yeah, so that's what we want to show. We want to show that the number of solutions to an equation of this type is what you would expect probabilistically, provided you have an absolutely irreducible assumption. All right. And how, how do we do that? Well, we will count the cardinality of a set, or at least we will find an upper bound for the cardinality of a set by finding a polynomial that's not the zero polynomial that has, where we have control on the degree and we know that it has zeros of high order on any point on every point of that set. And this means the set cannot be too large because we have a control on the degree and we have high multiplicity zeros on each point of the set. So the set cannot be so, too large. So that will be the idea. Um, and that alone is not enough because this gives only an upper bound. Uh, we want actually an asymptotic formula. So we need a trick to convert the upper bound into a lower bound, but this will come tomorrow. Um, a key point is that we make sure that our polynomial is not the zero. Yeah, that is a very crucial technical point because if it happens to be the zero polynomial, well, this has zeros of arbitrary order everywhere. So this gives us no information. And the key lemma that I'm going to prove now is the lemma that will later show us that our auxiliary polynomial is not the zero polynomial. Okay, so here is a somewhat technical looking lemma. And again, the, the idea is it will us uh, sh it will show us later that a certain polynomial is not the zero polynomial. So take a polynomial in FQX. Q is a prime power, FQ is a finite field. D is a divisor of the order of the multiplicative group. And G is the polynomial F to the Q minus one over D. Okay, suppose that y to the d minus f is absolutely irreducible. Take an integer k and suppose that you have certain polynomials h0 up to hd minus one in kx. So a K is FQ. R such that, so they have holes. Each HJ is of the form KI zero plus X to the Q 
ki1 plus and so on plus x to the qk kik for kij in fqx with degree relatively small degree of kij is bounded by q over d minus the degree of f so in other words we have if you look if you write this down as a polynomial you have certain monomials up to degree something like q over d and then there is a big hole and then the next monomial has already at least degree q and then there are some monomials and then there is again a big hole and the next monomial has degree x to the power q squared and so on yeah So all these HIs have lots of holes in their, in their somehow polynomial expansion. And then if you have a linear combination somehow, H0 plus GH1 plus and so on, plus G to the D minus one, H D minus one equals zero. This can only happen if all the Ks are zero then Kij must have been the zero polynomial for all Ij. Yeah, so somehow the powers G, G squared, G cubed up to G to the D minus one are algebraically independent with respect to the linear combination of the H zero, H one up to H D minus one. But of course, these H's are very special, um, but nevertheless, that's what the lemma says. Okay, proof. I give you first a very simple proof um, under a certain extra assumption. So assume first, that the degree of f and the number d are co-prime. In this case, the proof is very simple. And um, then you will hopefully believe the statement in general. And I'll show you with a mo much more complicated argument how to drop this assumption. OK, so if this assumption holds, well, if we just write down um, this equation in terms of monomials, we see that there is no overlap of monomials. All of these monomials, I mean, there is, there is no combination. All of these monomials are different. And so they all have to vanish. Yeah? So a typical monomial is something like g to the i, x to the power qj, kij, okay? And what's the degree? Well, it's not a monomial, a typical term, I should say, because kij itself is a polynomial. What's the degree? The, the degree, the degree is qj, plus i times the degree of g, which is q minus one over d times the degree of f, plus the degree of kij. And this can be written as q over d times dj plus im plus something that I call theta. So im is degree of f. with theta is strictly bigger than minus m and bounded by q over d minus m. And so you see, if there are overlaps, then these numbers for various i and j must overlap. But if d and degree of f 
are co-prime and I runs only in a residue system mod D because I runs from I runs from zero to D minus one. So here, zero less than I less than D minus one. So I runs in a, in a system mod D. And so this determines I, but then also J is determined. So we see that there is no overlap, but this is because D and degree of F are co-prime, yeah? So there is no overlap of exponents and hence all monomials must vanish. Okay, so this is how you could somehow heuristically, I mean, you may ask, why do we even look at this setup? Why do we look at these polynomials, H, I, S with holes and so on? And you see, I mean, in, in at least in special cases, it's relatively obvious that uh, the conclusion holds, but we are slightly more ambitious. We want to show this in general. And I give you now an algebraic uh, proof that this holds in general. So general proof now. Okay, first of all, um, by Frobenius, all of this is invariant under shifts. A X maps to X plus C. Yeah, so all of this. So if I change in the polynomial H, if I change X to X plus C, um, then X plus C to the power Q is X to the power Q plus C to the power Q. And so nothing changes in the statement. So I can, I can make linear shifts. And so without loss of generality, assume that f of zero is not zero. So if there is a zero at zero, then I just shift the polynomial to some place where there is not a zero. And this is possible because if, if f has, if everything is a zero, then the degree of f is at least q and then the statement is trivial. So we may assume this without loss of generality. And the idea now is um, to look at this, condition and make it symmetric, taking a d root of unity, okay? So let zeta in fq be a d root of unity. Recall that d is a divisor of q minus one, a d root of unity. And consider the symmetric version capital F J from one to D H zero plus zeta to the power J G H one plus and so on plus zeta to the power J G to the power d minus one h d minus one. So the term j equals d corresponds to the original polynomial. And I multiply this by a few other polynomials that basically differ by a root of unity. Okay, so this is symmetric in g zeta g, zeta square g, and so on, up to zeta d minus one g. Because if I replace g by zeta g, nothing happens. So it must be, it, if it's symmetric in these polynomials, then it must be an elementary symmetry. It must be a polynomial in the elementary symmetric polynomials. So f is a polynomial in the elementary symmetric 
polynomials in G, zeta, G, and so on. But all of them vanish. For instance, their sum vanishes because the sum of the powers of zeta, this being a deep root of unity, is zero. So all of them vanish except for the product. All of them vanish except the product. which is all the powers of zeta times g to the power d. And this is just g to the power d because zeta to the power d is one and g to the d is f to the power q minus one. Okay, so that means that f is a polynomial, let's call it g1, in fq to the minus one, and then in h zero up to hd minus one, where it's of degree d minus one in the first variable, and in the last variable, it's the combined degree is d. Okay, and we want to use Frobenius, so I would like to replace f to the q minus one by f to the power q. So I define a polynomial G2 of u, v, h zero up to hd minus one by saying that this is G1 of u over v, h zero up to hd minus one. This is of course not a polynomial, but if I multiply by v to the power d minus one, it becomes a polynomial. So then f to the power d minus one times f equals g2 of f to the power q f h zero up to h d minus one. Yeah, because f to the power q over f is just f to the q minus one. All right, so this holds under no circumstances, under, under no, uh, sorry, under no assumptions, in all circumstances, under no assumptions. But now I make the assumption that this combination vanishes. Now this combination is a factor of F. So for my particular choice, F is zero. So also G2 is zero. And we recall that it has degree D minus one here, degree D minus one here, and combined degree d in the remaining variables. So now I invoke the assumption. The assumption says that g2 of f to the power q f h zero h d minus one is zero. And I'm interested in this modulo x to the q and modulo x to the q, well, by Frobenius, f to the q, well, the only thing that remains is the zero term modulo x to the q. So that is f of zero and then f. And modulo x to the q, remember what the h's look like. The h's look like this. So modulo x to the q, only this first term survives. So we have k zero zero up to k d minus one zero. But by degree considerations, it's easy to see, and this is where we need the degree uh, assumptions on k. So this has degree less than Q. So if it's congruent to that modulo X to the Q, but it has degree less than Q, then it's actually equal to zero. 
Okay. So it must actually be equal to zero. So G2 of F0, F K0, zero, zero up to KD minus one zero is actually equal to zero. Okay. And now I plug this back. So recall that G1 was given, G2 was given in terms of G1 and G1 is given in terms of F. I plug all of this back. So substituting back, we obtain that G1 of, yeah, okay. So of F0 over F of X, k0, 0, 0, up to kd minus one, zero, equals zero. And here I define, so what I eventually need is a dth root of this. And so this is some algebraic extension. So define y to the d is one over f zero, f of x. So then, F Q of X at join Y has degree D over F Q of X. It's a field extension of degree D. And why is this the case? Here I use that Y to the D minus a constant times F of X is absolutely irreducible. So note that y to the d minus one over f zero f of x is absolutely irreducible. Here is where we need the assumption that this has algebraic degree d, okay? And if I now plug all of this back, then what I get is, so if I plug this back and write this in terms of F, then I get that, oops, that the product K zero zero plus Zeta J Y inverse K one zero plus and so on plus zeta j y inverse to the power d minus one k d minus one zero vanishes. And so one factor has to vanish. But then since the y's are algebraic, the powers of y are algebraically independent, it means that all the k's must vanish. And so K zero zero equals K one zero equals up to K D minus one zero equals zero. All right. So that means if I go back, that all of these are zero. So now I can just divide the whole equation by X to the Q and start over and repeat the argument. And in the next step, I see that these guys all vanish. And then in the next step, I see that these guys are vanish, uh, they, they all vanish. And then in the end, everything vanishes. Okay. So now divide by X to the Q and repeat the argument. All right, that's it. And just in time, it's 5.30. So that's what I wanted to show you. So you see this proof is a bit more complicated, but it does use the fact that y to the d minus f of x or a constant times f of x, which is the same thing, is absolutely irreducible. And we know that we have to use it at some point. 
this is where we use it. Otherwise, the main theorem will be wrong. You see that there is a cheap variation if we have an extra assumption, but in the end, we don't want this extra assumption. And you see, in, in this case, I mean, if we have this extra assumption, we don't need absolutely irreducible. I mean, this, for instance, rem removes the case that D is a square and it's a D is two and F is a square, for instance. So all these counter examples would not, would not show up um, in, this, in this special case, but we want to have it in general. I showed you the proof in general. You see, it's quite a bit more complicated, um, but well, that's what it is. And again, this is this lemma, this technical lemma is the input to show that later that the auxiliary polynomial that we will construct tomorrow will not be the zero polynomial. So the plan for tomorrow is to actually construct the auxiliary polynomial. That's what the polynomial method is all about. And then you'll see it in action. Okay, that's all for today.